Put your hands together for that. And uh, that is why we're here, right? We're here for people um, coming in and growing in their faith and being part of what we're doing at Crossover Church. So I would admonish you to jump on in. We're getting towards the end of the year, and we'll talk about it at the end of service. Uh, but what they're referring to and how to get connected to our church is something that we call Growth Track, which is really our membership classes, our assimilation classes, which happen directly after service. Today is step two of our Growth Track, which is really about discovering what your purpose is. So that's directly after service. I would encourage you uh, to join that as well. Also, next week is our pop-up shop. You see people with the sweaters on that say, we grow people with the hoodies. Uh, that will be the last time we're doing it this year, so after service next week. Come on now, Black Friday sale, get in where you fit in. Uh, they'll be on sale, uh, but you got to come check it out next week. Prices will go up, and uh, no, I'm excited about that. We use a portion of what we receive for that uh, to be able to do missions and outreach, uh, so it's important that we all come to support that. Is anybody ready for the word today? All right, I'm, I'm excited. We had last week off. Hope you were well rested. Um, I know it's a little chilly in here. Anybody chilly? I'm a little chilly. Uh, but the word is fire today. Amen. So uh, you're going to warm up real quickly. Uh, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Go there with me uh, real quick. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Y'all must be afraid to sit in the front. I'm telling you, the anointing goes to the first three rows right here. It's empty. I I I'm going to preach right there to that seat. No, uh, y'all know, I, I spit a little bit, so y'all y'all okay. All right, amen. Second Samuel chapter 6. Let's pray, and let's get into the Word. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you in this moment right now that we'll be able to receive what you have for us today. Lord, I ask that you would give us a clear mind to receive uh, your Word, a Word that's transformative, and as the grass withers and the flower may fade, it is your Word that stands forever in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Uh, here, here's a deep question at the beginning of my message, right? What do you do when you first go to somebody's house for the first time? I don't know about you, but that is a difficult time for me because I'm taking on context clues. First thing I'm looking for is, does everybody have their shoes on? Uh, because if everybody has their shoes on, then I'm going to keep my shoes on. But if everybody has their shoes off, then I'm probably going to take my shoes off. Ladies, have you ever been caught slipping? Uh, you went over somebody's house and you had your shoes on, and then they said, no, nah, at, at our house, you got to take your shoes off. And you started to think about, man, it's been a while since I had that pedicure. <laughs> and, and then you take your shoes off, and then you forgot your footies in your purse, and you forgot to lather up, you forgot to put your lotion on. All of a sudden, you know, you're curling up your feet and looking for a cover. All right? Has that ever happened to any lady? You're not going to be honest with me today. But you forgot to put that lotion on and lather up. All right? Because you thought it was one of them houses that they was cool. But they said, no, you got to take your shoes off here. Sometimes it's confusing and it's frustrating for me. I I've been in homes before and I sat down and they said, hold on, man. You can't sit down on that couch. It's the living room. We don't sit in the living room. Then why is it called the living room? I was over at my friend's house one day, true story, and he said, man, no, we don't eat off the paper plates over here, playboy. Some of y'all got plates, some of y'all got china, and it's confusing sometimes because we don't know the culture of that house because every house has a different culture. It's the same when it comes to the house of God, that every house of God has a different culture culture. And so what happens is when we come into different churches, we're trying to figure out, is this a church with their shoes on? Or if this is a, shirt, a church that has their shoes off? It doesn't mean that it's better or worse. It just means sometimes it's different. And what we do sometimes is we take cues from other people because we're trying to learn the culture. And that's the difficult part when you're starting something new because nobody knows the culture. There's been so many people who came up to me after service, probably about five or six since we started this church, and they say, Pastor, that message was good. It was on fire. I could have shouted. <laughs> well, well, how come you didn't shout? Why? Because they saw a church with their shoes on, and they wanted to have their shoes off. <laughs> because they're taking cues from the people in the house. Well, I got an announcement to make early in the morning. You can take your shoes off in this church. 
You can clap, you can shout, it don't bother me. You can move seats, you can do whatever you want. You can have musical chairs. We need a church that is passionate followers of Jesus. So I just want to let you know the culture. Because what happens is we take on the cues from other people. So in order to fit into the culture, there's a couple things you must do. Number one, if you don't fit into that culture, you'll end up leaving or you have to acquiesce to the rest of the culture. How do I know that? Because the first year of this church, my shouters used to shout and then they stopped shouting. Because y'all looked at them like they were crazy. But today I'm preaching a message. No, maybe we're the ones being crazy, not shouting. When the message is going forth, why? We're trying to figure out the culture. So next week, we're going to talk about the culture when the word goes forth. And then we're going to talk about the culture when it comes to giving, the heart of the house offering. By the way, have you participated in that? If this is the house that God has placed you in, then all of us should have the heart of the house to build the culture. But today, I want to talk about the culture of worship. The culture of worship. I know worship is not just about singing songs, but how do you know if you have the heart of worship? The heart of worship is a desire to be in his presence. How how do you know you got the heart of worship? It's a desire to be in his presence. And in our text today in 2 Samuel, we see King David, he's anointed but not yet appointed. This isn't my message, but I'm going to pause right there. He's anointed, but not yet appointed. Some of you in this room, that's why you're frustrated. Because you're anointed. God has a plan. He has a purpose for you. But yet, you don't have the title. You don't have that position. And in between is the time of frustration. It took David 20 years from being anointed to actually being appointed. And you're struggling because you've been on that job for three months? It took 20 years for David to actually walk into the title or position that God had for him when he was a little shepherd boy. And that's why we get confused because we're saying, God, you've called me to do something great, but yet when I'm looking at my circumstances, maybe I heard wrong. No, that's just the time of testing. He wants to see if you're faithful and you still believe God's word when he anointed you. The appointment would come on God's terms. But yet I'm called to be faithful. David was faithful in the cave. David was faithful when he ran for over 10 years after Saul. He continued to trust God that he would open up doors in his time and in his season. And then one day Saul, who's the first king of Israel, Saul had the title, but yet he was rejected by God. Don't ever get it twisted because you see somebody with a title and think God's hand is on them. Just because they're preaching from a pulpit doesn't mean that God's hand is on them. Just because they're a boss on the job doesn't mean God's hand is on them. Saul had the title, but he didn't have the anointing. Saul had the title, but he didn't have the position. David didn't have the title, but yet God called him. What do I look for when people look for titles and positions? I'm not looking for that. I'm looking, are you functioning in what God has called you to do right now? And then the title comes later. Before I ever called myself, by the way, I don't call myself that, a pastor, people came up to me and said, hey, pastor. I said, who are you talking to? Why? Because they saw me functioning in it before the title came. Many of us want the title, then we'll start functioning. But if you start functioning in the way that God has called you, then the title will come. There's a difference between anointing and appointing. That's not my message. That's not my message. Stop clapping. I'm just joking. In 1 Samuel 31, 1 Samuel 31, I'm moving quickly today. Saul, the king of Israel now, he's on the battlefield. And now Saul on the battlefield against the Philistines, he gets killed. Let's read the text because it says in verse 4, it says, Saul grown to his armor bearer, take your sword and kill me before these pagan Philistines come to run me through and taunt me and torture me. But his armor bearer was afraid and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor bearer realized that Saul was dead, he fell on his own sword and died besides the king. So Saul is on the battlefield because a leader is always in the front. He's not behind. And Saul ends up killing himself. Why? Because these Philistines, if they would have captured Saul, they would have took him and tortured him and tried to get information out of him. And so now his armor bearer, how many people want to be armor bearers? You hear that, right? Uh, We're going to do a sign-up sheet after service for armor bears. Do you know the armor bear's job? Nobody knows what an armor bear is. Sometimes you got people with six members but 15 armor bears. I don't understand that. But an armor 
bearer's job is not just to hold somebody's Bible. An armor bearer's job was to actually hold the weaponry and give it to the king. And also, as if he's in secret service, he was supposed to die for the king. So this is why when Saul said, hey, go ahead and kill me, he's like, I'm not going to do that. But when Saul dies, the armor bearer, he died as well. (laughs) You want to be an armor bearer? Sign up sheet right in the back, fellas, right in the back. Go ahead and sign up for that. Uh, Yeah. But Saul now ends up dying, and now it's David's turn. And now David in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 3, it says, David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel, and they anointed him king of Israel. At that moment, it's not when God anointed him, it's when the people anointed him. Because sometimes God will anoint you, but people won't be able to see it. It may take some time. So at that moment, that's when they said, okay, David, you're going to be the king. Okay, David, we're going to follow you. But if it wasn't for David defeating the bears and the lions, if it wasn't for David defeating the giant, if it wasn't for David being faithful in caves on the run, he would have never got to this point. Some of us in this room, you're anointed by God, but because you're going through trials, because you're going through difficulties, And you're not faithful. You don't stick in it. Sometimes when you pray to God, don't just pray that he'll remove you out of the trial. Pray that God will keep you in the trial. Because that proves if you're faithful unto him. And now David is the king of Israel. He waited 20 years. He's a millionaire now. He can do whatever he wants to do. Has all the money. Has all the power. He can skip the line at Popeye's and go right to the front. He don't have to wait. What would you do? In this moment, if you were David, what would you do if you were in office the first 100 days? That's important as a president, right? President Bush, the first 100 days, what did he do? He took his friends who were in Texas and he put them in the cabinet. I like that because Bush is like, hey, man, I got to put my boys on, man. Come on up here to the Oval Office. Then you had Clinton. He did health care reform in his first 100 days. Then you had Obama. Come on. Some of us remember that. The economic stimulus package. You remember that? Somebody was blessed because of that. Yeah, went right to the mall after that. (laughs) Why? It was to secure jobs and to create new jobs. President Trump's first 100 days had deep tax cuts for businesses. Why? Because the first 100 days is what they value. The first 100 days determines how their tenure would be. David now, in his first day in office, do you know what he did? The first day in his office... He said, uh, I got to return back the Ark of the Covenant. I got it in my notes right there. It says, Ken, they're not going to shout right there. That's what it says. They're not going to shout right there. See, your great-grandmother, she didn't know a noun and a verb and an adjective, but she knew when to shout. Your great-grandmother, she didn't know because when you say Ark of the Covenant, we don't understand that because we don't really look at the biblical text in the same way they did back in the day. But this is critical right now because uh, I don't know about you, but David says, listen, If we're going to be successful, we need the Ark of the Covenant. Let me break this thing down for a minute. This is before Jesus came. Jesus, when he died and he resurrected, he spent 40 days with his disciples teaching them about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not something outside of you. It is something within you. It is the Holy Spirit. And then he said, I want you to go to this little upper room and I want you to wait there for the Holy Spirit to come on you. And now you have the Holy Spirit if you're a believer. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave or forsake you. I don't care if it's your worst day. It doesn't leave you. I don't care if it's your best day. It doesn't leave you. Even when you're doing dirt, the Holy Spirit is still there. But they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they weren't holy yet because Jesus did not come. So God's presence was literally in what they called the Ark of the Covenant. So for 20 years, they didn't have the manifested presence of God. See, some of you have the Holy Spirit, but you don't have the manifested presence of God, that present presence of God. You know what I'm talking about when you're praying or worshiping, it's like the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You have the Holy Spirit, but that's the manifestation of that Holy Spirit. And so David said, man, we got to bring this Ark of the Covenant back because if we're going to be successful as a nation, it's only going to be because of God's presence. 
if you're going to be successful following Jesus, if you're going to be successful on the job or in that marriage, you need God's presence. Some of us, we've been praying for a man. We've been praying for a spouse. You've been praying for a job. You've been praying for all those different things. But if you don't have God's presence... None of that matters. If you have God's presence, even in your low moments, you will still believe that God will give you a heart of worship and that will sustain you. (laughs) But, But David said, listen, guys, before I make a law, before I do anything, I'm gonna bring back the ark of God. Look at the text, verse one of 2 Samuel chapter six. It says, then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Balao of Judah to bring back the Ark of God. The Ark of the Covenant was the place of God's presence. It was where they put the holies of holies there. And not everybody could enter. It was just a selected few. So now people are excited at this moment. David got the ark back. It was missing for 20 years. They start shouting. They start praising. They start going crazy. They had worship music going on. You know that shout music. They start, okay, turn that off, turn that off. Turn that off, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. 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 Nope, nope, nope. We keep our shoes on at this church. <laughs> That's all you got to do. Yeah, you know, been preaching for three years. They just press play and everybody start running. (laughs) They started shouting. Don't fall for it. I'm going somewhere. They started shouting, going crazy because the ark was headed back to where it should have been in the first place. I mean, I'm talking about, man... If you would have been there, you would have been like the DJs playing the favorite songs, everybody two-stepping, they doing everything, man. And it's amazing. Uh, But when you get to the text, this is critical, everybody, that when they're coming back, uh, they got this ark and they're bringing it back to Jerusalem. The text says right around verse two or three, it says that they put the ark of the covenant on a cart and they started pushing the ark back. And it says that Uzzah was there and the ark, I don't know if they was just shouting and dancing so much. Somebody tripped, right? And then the ark started to fall and Uzzah right there touches it with his hand and he dies. Uh Uh-oh, we don't skip chapters at this church. He died. So everybody was shouting, praising the Lord. The shout music was going on. But that wasn't worship in God's eyes. Okay. Because if you don't worship God the way that he wants to be worshipped, it's not worship. Worship first is about honoring God. They're shouting, going crazy. But yet God is like, "Uh uh-uh, that's not worship. Don't you ever get caught up just because you see people shouting. (laughs) Just because you see people dancing. If they don't do it according to the way God deems worship, then it is not worship. And we have to be careful sometimes because you're thinking like, man, Ken, wait a minute. This dude died for something we don't care about. Sometimes we don't care about his presence. This brother was trying to help the situation out and die. Why did he die? See, God is holy in Numbers chapter 4, verse 5. Read it when you get home. Numbers 4, verse 5 said specifically that only the Levites, the priests, could carry the Ark of the Covenant, and they couldn't put it on a cart. They had to carry it on their shoulders, but yet they tried to take shortcuts. Some of us in our worship, we want shortcuts. You want to know why? Because you're thinking in your mind when worship's happening, is it another song? Is when's pastor going to preach? When am I going? You try to time this thing out. What? You're trying to create shortcuts. And when you do that, it's hard for you to get in God's presence. God is saying, I'm holy, that you don't worship me according to your personality and your standards. It does not say in the Bible only extroverted people make a joyful noise. As if we're worshiping God according to our personality. No, I'm just, that's just not me. I don't do that. No, 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 no. God says, worship me. It says, everybody make a joyful noise. Shout unto the Lord. It says, when you come into the gates, come with thanksgiving. 
That's all of us. And when we worship God according to our personality, it's no longer worship. You are not the object of worship. God is the object of worship. The word worship is actually worth-ship, which means that's what you value. So what happens is when we want the songs the way we want, when we want everything on our timetable, we're not worshiping God. And God doesn't ask you if you like worship. (laughs) Matter of fact, worship isn't about us. Worship is about him. And so everyone now has the Ark of the Covenant, this object of God's presence, but yet someone died. And can you imagine David being there in that moment? Who's going to pick that up? Would you pick it up? If it fell on the ground, who's going to pick that up? Somebody just died shouting to God, and it's just on the ground. Like, we understand it because anybody watch Michigan and Michigan State football, whoever wins, right, they take this Paul Bunyan trophy, right? And they're carrying, that's like the Ark of the Covenant for them. They're excited. You see how excited they are just to carry this trophy that's meaningless, right? And sometimes we're more excited when our favorite team wins, when they have the Paul Bunyan trophy versus when God's presence dwells in us. I'm going to say it again because y'all didn't catch this. This dude died for something we don't care about. He died for something we don't necessarily value on an everyday basis. And now... He died, and it's on the ground, and David's like, okay, okay, we're going to stop right here. Uh, does anybody live close to here? Because I'm not picking that thing up. Hey, hey, hey Abinadad, Abinadad, oh, this your spot right here? Hey, we're going to put this thing in your basement, man. So they take the Ark of the Covenant, and they put it in Abinadad's house right here, and it, oh, Obed-Dedham's house, and they put it in his house. But real quick, everybody, Isaiah 29, 13 says this, and so the Lord says, these people say they're mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules. Let me give it to you from the urban version, the message translation. It says this, the master said these people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their hearts aren't in it because they act like they're worshiping me, but they don't mean it. Let me give it from the contemporary English version. I never read this one before, but I thought it was interesting. It says, these people praise me with their words but they never really think about me. They worship me by repeating rules made up by humans. So once again, I will do things that shock and amaze them and I will destroy the wisdom of those who claim to know and understand. Jesus even says it in the New Testament. He says, man, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. He's repeating Isaiah right here. They were worshiping God according to man-made rules. And we do that oftentimes. Worship leaders, sometimes they got to be like, lift your hand, turn around, slap your neighbor. And it's mechanical. It's man-made rules. But if you ever get in God's presence, nobody got to tell you to lift your hands. Nobody got to tell you to spin around. Nobody got to tell you to be excited. But we're repeating what everybody else said. Simon says, lift your hands. Simon says, touch your nose, knees. No, you're out. Worship is about your heart. You can have your hands lifted, but you're not worshiping God. (laughs) David was a man after God's own heart. (laughs) And morally, most of us were better than David. Did you kill somebody? Did you do what David did? But God cared about his worship. He cared about his heart. And sometimes we get caught up in these religious, we get caught up in these man-made rules where people have to pump and prime us. How do I know that? Because sometimes instead of worshiping God, we worship the gift that God gave. I don't know who your favorite artist is, but if Tasha Cobb came in this house, man, she's a wonderful gift of God. But here's the reality. Sometimes we'll worship her and not worship God. How do I know that? Because in worship, the first thing you would think about is grabbing your cell phone and let everybody know that you're in the place Tasha Cobb was. I've been in places where everybody just grabbing their phone out and God's presence is there because we care more about the show than we care about God's presence. Oh, I got to grab my phone and let everybody know on Facebook. And God's presence is going forward. And nobody's even moved anymore. You're not curious with the Holy Spirit anymore. You're not curious. You don't think God's doing anything in your life right now. 
So we wake up every single day and we don't even think about spending time with him. Why? Because your prayers go unanswered because you're not curious enough and you don't get in God's face. Listen to me. I wouldn't even have to teach a sermon series on prayer if your prayers got answered. If your prayers got answered, nobody would have to tell you to pray. (laughs) If you thought being in God's presence, reading your word, I wouldn't have to say get in your word. So there's a disconnect because we don't have a heart of worship. Because we want things immediately. And I just said that it took David 20 years. You remember when Samuel came to the house and his dad was like, he not, he not even in the house, he, he out there. And then David now is on the run and now David's a grown man. And now God said, okay, you're it. And David said, now I'm going to bring back his presence. Crossover, I just want to submit to you in this moment right now. And as I look at this, I'm challenged by that. Am I worshiping God? Or am I just going through the routine because I'm supposed to? I don't. I'm lifting my hands, but my heart is thinking about something else. I'm thinking about what to eat. I'm thinking about what to do after the game. And right now, even in this moment, the enemy's working right now in your mind to get you distracted. Exodus chapter 3. Can I get off my notes for a moment? Exodus chapter 3, you see Moses, God is at this uh, this burning bush, and Moses comes up to God, and he says, Moses, I want to use you to deliver the children of Israel. And do you know why he delivered the children of Israel? The text says, tell Pharaoh to let my people go so they can worship me. (laughs) Because if you're in bondage, you can't worship him. And some of you, the reason you're struggling worshiping God, because you're not free yet. And the reason God wants you to be free is so you can worship him. Why did God send all these plagues to Egypt? Because six times out of the ten plagues, he says, Pharaoh, let them go so they can worship me. Exodus chapter 20, the first commandment, don't put other gods before me, worship me. I'm the God that brought you out of Israel when you were in your bondage. Not to do it just so you can get a nice car. Not just so you can get a better job. I brought you out so you can worship me. And when Moses goes to receive the commandments, number one, don't put other guys before me. They're at the bottom of the mountain worshiping another God because they got impatient. We got to stop rushing God's presence because when you end up rushing God's presence, you will start worshiping another idol. I'm preaching good today. Y'all can look at me in that tone of voice if you want. He says, man, they, they honor me with their lips. That's lip service. But their hearts are far from me. They're saying the right things. They're singing the songs. They're looking at the screens and everything, but but their hearts (laughs) are far from me. And I understand. I get it. Because we've been in those moments. See, see, most of you just kind of came to our church when we've been in this location. But if you were here at the beginning, you would know that, man, there was a time we had, we were going through about four or five worship teams or leaders in the moments, man. And I think I was getting ahead of God in those moments. And so I finally got to the point where I said, okay, let, let me start praying again. I know that seems crazy, but sometimes we try to strategize, we try to think all these things, but I'm just going to say that sometimes, or whatever, when you get to the end of yourself, that's the moment you start praying. Praying is not the first thing on our minds. We try to figure things out. And so I went on this prayer walk, and I'm like, God, what's going on, man? And he said, just just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. No worship. What? I'll be honest with you in that moment. I was like, it's going to last about two weeks. It ended up being about two years. You were there. We had the screens and everything like that. And it was the moment, man, I'll be, can I be honest today? Oh, the hardest part was getting up on stage. And I know I used to make it. Tasha Cobb's in the house, everybody. Pay attention to the screen. And I remember I was at Southfield High School in those moments. I was in the parking lot shaking everybody's hand. And they were like, man, this pastor meets you in the parking lot. No, I just didn't want to be in there. <laughs> Because, Ken, you say that you're honoring me. You're giving lip service, but your heart is far from me. And I remember the Holy Spirit saying, are you actually waiting for someone to come in to worship me? 
are you, are you, are you waiting for someone to come in so you can worship me? <laughs> so it taught me. Okay. There's moments in your life where you don't get your way, and what does it do? It teaches you how to worship him, not for what he does, but for who he is. Some of us are worshiping God for what he does. <laughs> but if you can get to the point where you worship God for who he is, sometimes he'll withhold things from you to see if you're worshiping the thing he'll give you or if you will actually worship him. You got to be careful getting blessed because sometimes you will start worshiping the thing he blessed you with instead of worshiping the person who's the blessor. There's been times in my life where God blessed me and my heart went towards the thing instead of my heart going towards him. That's called idolatry. Let me get back to my notes. Y'all not feeling me today. Let me get back to my notes. And so there's moments in life where God will not give you what you want that shows you, do you have the heart of worship? And so sometimes you come to the end of yourself, you'll start praying in those moments. Because a heart of worship is a desire to be in his presence. And so for our church, man, I mean, I got young kids. I got a seven-year-old. I got a five-year-old. And man, they're doing a great job in children's church. And I see Antoine here. I'm like, man, it's the first time he's been here in about three months. Why? Because he's been slaving in the back for our kids. Can you put your hands together for him? And, and he's been doing a phenomenal job. But I'm like, man, this brother needs some help. Like, he, he needs some help up in this thing. So I'm like, I'm reading the scripture and it says, ask the Lord of the harvest to bring more workers into the harvest field. And I said, we're going to do something crazy. We're we just going to pray. God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm not making any more phone calls. I'm not sending out any more emails. It's on you. And if you don't bring it, then you don't want us to have it. So Saturday morning, come on, everybody, 9 a.m., we were out there, about four or five people. And at the end, we would say this, bring more workers into the harvest field. Bring more workers into the harvest field. Then all of a sudden, I get an email a couple weeks ago that some person uh, wanted to come to Detroit to fill a need. She's sitting right over there. Wave your hand. Because this, when you start praying, God will talk to somebody in Mississippi, and they'll wake up and say, wait a minute, I'm enjoying the weather, but God's telling me to go to Detroit. So she drove up last week from Mississippi. Y'all not shouting. I want a church. And I, she came in the doors and I said, remember we sat down. I was like, so are you joining? I don't want to put no pressure on you. She said, God already spoke. So she's here. So she moved here. All right. And it wasn't because I was a good preacher. It wasn't because I sent emails. It wasn't because I known the right person. It's when you pray and get in his presence, God will answer the prayer. Some of us try to outsmart God. God's already got this thing worked out. He wants to know, sit your butt down and allow him to be God. Some of us are trying to be God, so he sits down and says, call on me when you need me. I'm losing my voice. <sighs> and so at the beginning of January, I'm telling you right now, at the beginning of January, we're doing 21 days of prayer. Come on, come with me. And you got a decision to make. Yes, we're fasting. Somebody's stomach just grumbled right there. But you got to figure out, do you want his presence or do you want something to eat? God will send unlikely people on his time. And he wants to know, do you have the heart of worship? Do you want to be in my presence? And so David... Now say, listen, man, the ark's on the ground. Now I'm back to my notes. The ark is on the ground. He said, we got we to gotta put this in somebody's house, man. Obed-Edom, you live around here. His name is Obed-Edom in the text. Obed-Edom. Everybody say that. Obed-Edom. 
All right, what'd you learn in Crawford? I don't know, but it was this guy named Obed Edom. All right. They took the ark and put it into his house. All right, now, your grandma was shot on this point, so I'm just giving you the cue, all right? So the ark was missing for 20 years. <laughs> they take the ark, I'm about to end up shouting, and, and give it to Obed Edom. And, and this is what it says right here. It says in verse 11, it says, the ark of the covenant remained there in Obed Edom's house, hold on, for three months and the Lord blessed Obed Edom and his entire household. Why did Obed Edom get blessed? Because the presence of God was there. If you would get the presence of God in your household, I got an announcement to make, everything would be blessed. Stop waiting for a blessing. If you get the presence of God there, everything blessed. When you get the presence of God there, everything you touch is blessed. For three months, it was there, and his whole household was blessed. Not just him, but his kids, everyone he was attached to. And David was like, hold up, bro. <clears throat> I need that back. <laughs> because if you're blessed, I need to bring that back to my house. And when you find someone who's blessed in a particular area, stop hating on them. What you need to do is take them out for coffee and say, what are you doing? Every day, my wife would tell you, I'm on a Zoom conference talking to somebody when I see them and say, man, he's blessed in that area. What are you doing, bro? Every day, that's the conference. That's what I do pretty much. I'm looking at a person like, man, your church is blessed in this area. What do you do? I want to learn from you. But what we do, we hate on everybody. But here's the thing. God's not a respecter of person. If he can do it for them, he'll do it for me. God doesn't have classifications of Christians. The same Holy Spirit that you have is the same Holy Spirit they got. But I want to know some things. Because I'm looking at your life, man. Maybe your marriage is blessed. I'm looking at your life, man, and it's something. You got wisdom. I'm looking at your life, and man, I want that blessing in my life. And so it says this, that David now, in verse 12, the Lord had blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of what? Because of the ark of God. It wasn't because of his degrees. Some of us got more degrees than a thermometer, but it doesn't matter, right? It's not your intellect. It's not everything you know. I know sometimes we think it's the people you know, and that's part of it as well, but he was blessed because of God's presence. God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you, not just for you, so for his glory. That's why he wants to do it. But you got to be spending time in his presence. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with great celebration. So David looked at this dude and was like, hey, man, I need that back, bro. Like, I need it back because God's blessing you. Man, let's take this ark. This is God's presence and bring it back to Jerusalem so everybody else could be blessed. Verse 13, it says that after the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and fattened calf. Now, hold on a second. This is so critical. This is why you come to crossover. The first time, what did they do? They tried to push it on a cart. They wanted to rush that presence. Now they said, every six steps, we're going to make a sacrifice, and we're going to worship. Here's the critical part right here. See, I know what you're thinking. It's the end of the year, and all of us, you're here. You want to be in God's presence. You want to spend time praying. You want to spend time in his word. But if we're honest, here's the default answer when I say, how are you growing your relationship with God? Well, I can pray more. I can read my word more. We don't do it. You want to know Why? God is not looking for you to add that to your calendar. He's looking for you to kill something. You missed it. Because when they brought the ark back, it says that they had to sacrifice something to be in his presence. What I'm saying is there's some things right now you got on your calendar that shouldn't be there. God is not an addendum. He is not an accessory. God is looking for you to kill something that shouldn't be there so you can worship. Because sometimes those things that are there prevent us from worshiping. He's not looking for your five minutes. He's looking for that thing that you worship to kill itself, for you to kill it, in order for 
you to worship him. It says David learned. He said, we're not taking shortcuts anymore. We're not just going to put this thing on a cart anymore. Every six steps, we're going to worship him. So David now is like one, two, three, four, five, six, and they started to worship God. Now, this is critical, everybody, because seven is the number of completion. He said, we're going to worship God before that thing is complete. How do you know you have trust in God? You don't just worship God when the door opens. You learn how to worship God when you're in the hallway before the door opens. And now they start worshiping God, and they're so excited because the presence of God is coming back. For 20 years, it was missing. For 20 years, something wasn't right. But I'm looking at this text, and I'm like, David, the first thing on his mind is God's presence. And right now, we're getting to the point of Christmas time. Come on, man. The first thing on our mind isn't about Jesus. <laughs> the first thing on our mind isn't about the things of God. What? But David said, I got to get in his presence. Because if I get in his presence, everything there will take care of itself. I don't know about you. And I don't have to wait to January 1st to make a New Year's resolution that we can get in his presence right now. What does that mean? It means something different for everybody. I'm not the judge and the jury of your life. I don't know what that means to you. I'll let the Holy Spirit do the work. But what I'm saying is stop looking for a blessing. Stop looking for things outside of God. Everything you need is inside of God. And if we get in his presence, we'll understand how to worship God and have the heart of worship. You want to know why? Because his presence is heaven. Would you stand on your feet? Amen.